The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. Now, I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, continuing directly into the questions, we said last week that we had a stack that we hadn't gotten through. So let's go to a question that we've been asked several times in different ways, but it really comes up about the same. And here's the question. It says, love your show. Why is gold dropping in tandem with the markets when one would think that with more uncertainty and growing bailouts in Europe that gold would be heading higher? Is this strictly people trying to deleverage, or is this money going into the dollar? Or is it just a normal correction, David? This is a great question, and actually we have this echoed in a number of other questions as well, to one degree or another. And as we mentioned last week, where we see some overlap, we'll just try to consolidate around that particular theme. Right. Kevin, I mean, in a nutshell, I think you're looking at a, at a temporary tandem move on the basis of liquidity announcements. And so you're seeing a boost to all asset classes on the basis of availability of liquidity in the marketplace. Right. So more money is going to be spent in Europe, more money is going to be spent in the U.S., and all of a sudden the speculative juices are flowing, and so you do have that short-term impact really to all asset classes, which is changing the correlation between equities and gold, but I would emphasize on a very limited basis, on a very short-term basis. Well, David, we talked about noise sometimes being the short-term market moves. You know, We've looked at the Dow-Gold ratio for the last, well, for decades, but let's just look at the last decade. We've gone from a Dow-Gold ratio, where you divide the price of the Dow by the price of gold, go from 42 to 1 down to between 6 and 7 to 1 at this point. But David, even though sometimes gold and the stock market in the long run go in opposite directions, you can't count on that in the temporary. Well, Kevin, you're right in looking at that Dow-Gold ratio because that is really where we see the forest for the trees. Right. When you get too close to it, that's when you begin to lose, I think, the, the proper perspective on what is a major move in non-correlation, wherein actually, barring 2008 and barring you know the present short-term blip where there is correlation, you're looking at close to an 85% non-correlation between gold and equities, right. it, making it one of the only asset classes which is non-correlated today. Now, the, here's one of the things I would also emphasize. The classic non-correlation extends to the bond market and to the dollar market as well. Kevin, I think this is where we begin to see fuel added to the fire for the gold market here in the coming 6 to 12 months. A significant rollover in the bond market will end up fueling the next stage of the gold bull market. So what you see on a very short-term basis is positive correlation is just that very short-term, and we would be going back to that Dow-Gold ratio as, as a support for that. Well, and David, I think it's important to note that when we go through a currency collapse or when a country goes through a currency collapse, like Germany in the 1920s, you can't really look at the value in that currency to see what the correlation is. When you're talking about the Dow-Gold ratio, you're literally talking about taking the price of the Dow and dividing it by gold. Because, of course, in Germany in the early 1920s, their stock market rose just fine. Gold just rose quite a bit more. Another point to make on the equity market, Kevin, is this is an impact due to short-term liquidity provisions, right. when in fact, if this had to do with liquidity impacting the equity market and changing something structurally, where, where we were in fact adding stimulus adequate to bring about a new growth cycle, you would see a reduction in the gold price and you would begin to see equities move forward. Because again, the primary reason that you want to own gold in a period like this is the non-performance of equities, the non-performance of any other asset class. When you have negative or low real rates of return, gold is favored. Right. If the prospects were changing for the equities market and we had a new growth trend in front of us where you'd have positive real rates of return in, in other words, us, the real bottom of the market that you think may come in the next few years. Exactly. You would begin to see a drift. And if there was new stimulus, that stimulus may in fact drive the equity market higher and gold lower. That's not the case. And I think the market understands that this is a knee-jerk response. Everything is going to get a boost given sort of the, the profligate spending by the Fed or other central banks. And, and what it acknowledges, too, is that there is no way to discern where that liquidity will flow. It should flow into the financial market somehow, some way. But what you do have is an acknowledgement that there's likely to be an inflationary impact, and that inflationary impact is likely to hit commodities. So commodities are, are almost a higher beta play 
on equities when you're talking about these short-term liquidity spurts. Okay, now, David, Please I'm going to Please focus on the long-term trend, though, because that is absolutely critical. What we've talked about before, ignore the noise and look for the true signal. Okay, now, David, what I was going to interrupt you about was you use the word beta, and I don't know that all of our listeners necessarily understand what you mean by beta on an investment, but I think it's something that everyone needs to know. Essentially, it's what we have been talking about. It just happens to be a word that's used specifically in this industry, and it implies correlation. So something that has a beta of one is directly in correlation or directly in lockstep with the market. So if you have a lower beta, if your correlation is less than one, then it's going to be that much divergent from the market. Or a higher beta, it's going to exaggerate whatever the market does. David, on the subject of having more gold than the third in the triangle at different times, maybe some in cash, some on stocks, I think we should go to Steve's question. Yeah, Steve says, I get the concept of the investment triangle and its purpose, but wonder why in this climate... Precious metals would not qualify for not only the insurance side or base of the triangle, but also for the liquid or cash side. Hmm. With fiat currencies continuing to slide worldwide in purchasing power and the value of metals continuing to rise, I'm hesitant to rebalance moving out of metals and into cash, especially dollar-denominated. Thanks for the weekly commentaries. I look forward to Wednesday mornings and listen to each of your podcasts repeatedly. Okay, so David... There are times, and I know you've brought this up to me, there are times when you treat the right side of the triangle, which is the cash side, as also a quickly liquid gold side. You've put some gold in there if you knew you weren't going to need to spend that money in the next two weeks. And how about even the left side? I mean, do we sometimes invest in gold for a growth process, keeping the insurance intact. Well, I think this is one of the things that that investors have to take an accurate and honest appraisal of. And this comes back to what do you know and what don't you know? And the reality is none of us know what the future holds. If if you don't begin the investment process with a degree of of humility, you will learn very quickly just how humbling the market can be. Even gold. Can well, that, you. That's exactly right. <laughs> right. So, And this is the point. I, I think it's a bad idea to overload on the metals because you're essentially concentrating your risk around one asset class. Right. Now, that's in theory. In practice, I have chosen to take a part of my quote-unquote liquid position there on the right-hand side of the triangle right. and substitute kilo bars in something very generic. Kruger and is just as much a substitute. There you're talking about something that has to be the cheapest possible product on the planet. Yeah, because you to, may liquidate quickly to pay for a bill. Exactly. So the difference between what you paid and what you get for it really does matter if you're talking about moving in and out of a position within days or weeks or months. Whereas you you can take a little bit more of a sanguine view if you're holding something for 5 or 10 or 15 years and allocate uh, accordingly. So I generally think that it's a bad idea to concentrate your risk on the basis that you don't know what happens. And and I'm not suggesting that we adopt a sort of blasé or what I would consider sort of a cop-out, the Wall Street cop-out of diversity. Diversify, diversify, diversify. Sure. Diversification absolutely has its place. It does. And I think that's represented in the investment triangle. The question is, are you overdoing a good thing? I grew up in a family where if a little is good, a lot is better. Right. I have to pause and say, no, actually, a little is good, period. Right. A little is good, period. A little vitamin D is fine. A little too much, and guess what you end up with? A sunburn. You know, your 30 minutes in the sun per day, which is the new prescription, sans the, the sunscreen, is now supposed to be good for you. Just right. be aware of getting a sunburn. A little is good. That does not argue that a lot is better. I appreciate the question, though, because we're really at an interesting point in time, and you need to keep those disciplines in mind and come up with a personal solution that you're comfortable with, realizing that if you choose to concentrate your risk, you may be forced to play the patient's game and may have to adopt a regular daily dose of of Maalox or Pepto-Bismol because by concentrating your risk, you realize if you're wrong in the short run, you will have far more volatility in the portfolio. And that's something you have to accept at the front end if you're looking at making that kind of a decision, Steve. Well, and David, I think it's important to talk about risk as a relative term as well. I mean, when we talk about risky investments, there are investments out there that are paper assets that are just pure fly-by-night, and they may not even have any value in the future. No one has ever gone broke owning gold. 
Now, it goes up, it goes down, and yeah, maybe you've got too much gold when it's going down sometimes. But, but maybe think, not enough when it goes up. You know, you and know, I think and, that's a healthy appraisal of the psychology of being in a bull market. Right. When you're in a bear market, you own too much of anything. When you're in a bull market, you don't own enough. And I think that's something you have to take and acknowledge as an investor is, are you allowing your own emotions to take over? And the reality of potential profit or perhaps you're on the other side of that and, and simply you're looking at the potential for loss in other asset classes, are you being ruled by either greed or fear? And if you can parse that out, determine that you're making a wise decision, know what is involved in having a concentration beyond a regular allocation, then you may be in a position to, to deal with the consequences of those choices, which is very important. You have to own that up front. Well, David, in a similar vein, we got a question from Vermont that I think was very well worded, very well thought through, like we talked about last week. These questions are coming in, and you can tell we've got very thoughtful listeners. Okay, starting out, this is from Paul. Over the past year, this program has done an extremely good job addressing so many issues that this year I'm having difficulty coming up with questions you haven't already answered. But recently, you've talked about the need to focus not on liquidity issues, but instead on solvency issues. The institutions that are the most obviously bordering on insolvency are large banks and governments. Do you see these solvency issues and the corresponding counterparty risk associated with them extending beyond these current suspects? For example, do you see credit unions or traditional conservative insurance companies being touched by insolvency? What about other industries seemingly unrelated to finance, like Apple or Google? Also, could you explain the distinction to be made now between a precious metals base and a cash base in relation to the triangle? This is what you were talking about, Dave. As fiat currencies begin to devalue, I see great difficulty in cash instruments having the ability to perform their mandate to be available for buying opportunities. In this environment, what advantages do cash instruments have over precious metals in fulfilling this mandate? Thanks, as always, for your incredible insight and your thoughtful questions you pose to the wide range of experts on your program. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the question. Well, diving into the first part, I think the current suspects, uh, you know, banks and governments, that does get extended to credit unions mm -hmm. and even insurance companies. And I think this is an issue where you have to know what's hidden under the carpet. We know that there are a few insurance companies that have looked at the risk in the marketplace and taken an accurate appraisal and have positioned their portfolio portfolios accordingly. For them, that means they have less than 1% exposure to gold, and they still have 99% exposure to paper assets. Well, which, I think of Northwestern. And I mean, we're talking about some institutions that I think will survive, but the question is, to what degree are they impaired in the process? Sure. You know, your mutuals are obviously much more stable than any other insurance company, but I think you will find a tremendous amount of leverage in their portfolio, a tremendous amount of illiquidity, particularly in the insurance companies, where they've been enticed into private equity. They've been enticed into a number of new venues, hedge funds and private equity primarily, and are hoping to derive a greater rate of return on that basis, new allocations. So they've, in fact, compounded the risk over the last 10 years, not reduced it. Right. And again, for the few that have, in, in the instance of Northwestern Mutual, taken on a gold position, it represents such a small share of their total assets. While it's there, and I'm glad it is, it's token. Don't you best. think it telegraphed, though, that they're thinking that way a little more than some insurance company absolutely absolutely yeah. and, I, and I think that makes all the difference in the world in terms of who survives and doesn't because this is an environment where certainly if you are related to finance if you're related to the investment worlds if you're tied to what happens to the US currency or you know your ability to finance on cheap terms yes you will be impacted and that does go beyond banks and governments so it, and it does eke into the corporate world as well so an apple a google a 3m you talked about 3m last week solvency is something that nobody wants to see go away but the issue right? really with some of these institutions non-financial you know they're actually producing something or have a service that is very attractive is that they have revenues to offset losses and in fact don't need to finance their they're operations. making widgets yeah, yeah they're making widgets and have balance sheet strength. Frankly, if you wanted to say, where are your greater risks? Theoretically, your greater risks are with banks and governments right. more than corporate America or any other corporation around the world. 
I'm not saying that you won't see share prices dive over the next several months or years in the general equities markets, but, but you're talking about the difference of being able to survive intact and actually come out with a product that's still attractive. This is the issue. If you think of a Campbell Soup, their shares actually did all right during the Great Depression. They were actually able to reduce the water content in the can and increase what they could deliver in terms of calories to the end person right. and increase profits in so doing. You know, so there was creative ways for companies. This is, again, the difference. Corporations are compensated by thinking outside the box and coming up with creative ways to survive. Whereas lending institutions and banks, uh, that type of well, thing. Well, lending institutions and banks are also creative, but they are subject to an increase in the cost of capital. Yeah. That's out of their control. There's variables that they cannot control, which can cause their demise. Governments, the last part, guess what? You don't have creative out-of-the-box thinking. The bureaucratic red tape that we see even in certain emerging market giants today, you'd say, well, that's not the case in the U.S. I mean, clearly, we are, we're a well-oiled machine. Look at our gross domestic product. Yeah. Look at the size of government. We have a large institution that requires so much capital just to feed itself. The concept of Leviathan here, they're not interested in changing. They're interested in existing and growing. Actually, they're interested in existing and growing just like any other corporation. They just don't have to be creative about it. They can be confiscatory instead of creative, and I think that's one of the underlying problems. I think that takes you to the second part of the question, Dave. Again, this motive to confiscate wealth, whether it's through inflation or you know the stimulus money, printing of money, however you want to put it. The second part of the question is asking about liquidity and how liquid and how viable cash will be in the future if the government continues on the path that it's on. Well, and I, th I think this is maybe the question for a long-term investor versus a short-term trader. And there right. really is a different response mechanism here because the long-term investor is going to be wrong on this in the short run. You can come up with an appraisal that says, I don't want to be in dollars, I don't want to be in fiat currencies of any kind because I think ultimately they will reach their demise. Just understand that you may be dead on. You may be absolutely correct in your long-term conclusions. Sure. The market may correspond with that. Guess what? In the short term, you may be wrong, and you're going to have to decide whether or not you're comfortable being wrong in the short term, because what you cannot underestimate is the trained behavior, the recent muscle memory trained into Wall Street managers, which is when you need liquidity, even if you are concerned about solvency, where do you end up going? you end up going to the deepest capital pools possible. And that does mean the Treasury. That does mean the U.S. dollar. Even though when you're talking about solvency issues, yes, we are talking about balance sheet bankruptcy. Right. That still does not get around the trained behavior or, you know, again, what we were describing is muscle memory trained into Wall Street practitioners. So I think in the short run, you can see an additional run-up in treasuries. In the short run, you can see an additional run-up in the dollar. But what we're watching right now, Kevin, is, is evidence just to how that is shifting over time. We're not seeing the same volumes that we did in 2008 coming into the dollar. We're already at elevated levels in the treasury at elevated levels in the Treasury, and we have yet to see a rollover right. in equities. So from what point do we go? If we do see a rollover in, in the equities market, you're buying high in the Treasury space. Are you convinced that there are people going to be buying even higher and even higher at these nosebleed levels? Well, and not just in the paper markets, but David, let's just hypothetically say that, let's say real estate, a property that you've been looking at for a while. Let's say it's dropped 50, 60, 70 percent, and you need liquidity that you had put that you probably should have kept in dollars short term. If you knew you were going to buy it soon, you probably should have kept it in dollars. But no, you had it in gold instead, and now you sell that gold for that piece of real estate. If you're selling early, you made the wrong liquidity decision, did you not? Well, I think there's a couple of the factors there, Kevin, and I don't want to diverge too far from Paul's question, but with real estate, you're talking about supply and demand. In the areas of the country which have been hit hardest have been hit hardest on the basis of an overproduction of supply. There's just too much on the market and it has to be chewed through. But what that neglects, if you're out there buying value at these levels, what it neglects is the repricing of all those assets, even if they are on sale today, hmm. everything gets repriced as the treasury market gets repriced and as yields begin to increase. Is that in the next six weeks? Is that in the next six months? Again, we're already at nosebleed levels in terms of the price of treasuries, which means we're in the basement, basement, bottom basement levels for yield. 
we see an increase in bond yields, Kevin, as a response to the world appraising risk in the Treasury market differently over the next 6, 12, 18 months. Maybe I'm off on the timing. I've been off for two years on the timing on this, Kevin. The reality is the turn in the interest rate market has surprised me, has surprised me in terms of how well, long it takes. Well, your tax dollars have been what have kept that interest rate market down, Dave. So it's not being wrong in the timing if somebody's messing with the system. Direct monetization of Treasuries is certainly responsible for suppressing yields at this point. So where would yields be today if not for suppression of those rates by the Federal Reserve? And I guess the same question can be asked. Where would the price of gold and silver be today if the CME hadn't changed rules at a strategic point? They were effective, very effective, probably more effective than they anticipated being. But they can't control it in the long run. Well, that's exactly right. And so the trends, whether it is interest rates or gold, I think are compelling, uh, one to avoid, one to very much participate in, because nothing has changed in terms of the trajectory of either of those markets. Once again, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. David, here's an interesting one. Let's go ahead and go to various currencies, just that topic of other countries. Uh, Here's the question. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your show. I think it's excellent. Thank you. As I understand, you are open to receiving questions from your listeners. I wanted to take this opportunity to ask if you've ever done some sort of study on the main currencies of the world to see which ones have more, quote, backing of gold. Although I know, in reality, no currencies are backed by gold these days. I hear you often speaking a lot about the Fed and saying that the U.S. is printing too much money. And that definitely looks like that is the case. However, I just wonder how the Fed's monetary policy compares to other central banks around the world. I came across an article today which suggests the Bank of England has been increasing its balance sheet substantially, more than its U.S. counterparty, and if the sterling pound was to be fully backed by gold, an ounce of gold should cost 30,000 pounds. I was very surprised to see some of these graphs. So, I wonder, how much backing, again, in quotation, since nothing's backed, of gold does the dollar have, and what would be the price in dollars for an ounce of gold if the greenback was backed fully by gold? What about the Swiss? What about the euro? It would be interesting to get your views on this subject. David, this has to do with gold reserves of countries. Even though the currencies are no longer tied to gold, is there something we should be looking at as far as the reserves of these countries? Well, Kevin, I think certainly the gold reserves of any given country add balance sheets to support. I mean, that was one of the reasons why the Swiss franc for years was considered a quote-unquote hard currency. Even though it wasn't fully backed, they had a lot of gold. Kevin, and that changed within the last decade. They still have a small gold backing, but nothing like it used to be. The euro has a small gold backing as well. The U.S. dollar has a small gold backing. Relative to our liabilities, it's insignificant. And and just, you know, again, this is a helpful illustration because essentially the method used in 1933 by FDR to back our liabilities, you know, he confiscated gold, he brought in the metals and wanted to assure, created a two-tier system for our currency. Right, sure. The Europeans knew they could trade dollars in for what they were worth in gold. Right, but that was not allowed domestically. So what he did when he bought gold from the general public at $20, $21 an ounce, and then turned around and pegged the price at 35, he ran the math. Very simply, how do we back all of our liabilities with the reserves that we have, and we're going to put gold at that price? Right. It was an essential downgrade to the U.S. dollar. It was a devaluation by close to 65%, but it gave our foreign creditors the assurance that on a balance sheet basis, we are in fact in balance. If we had somebody step in right now who said, I'm going to fix this dollar problem, we're going to revalue gold to the amount of dollars that we've printed. What would we need to put gold at? Over $11,000 an ounce. So there's an interesting correlation here. Yes, whether it's 30,000 pounds to offset their liabilities, $11,000 or more to offset our own liabilities here in the U.S., we're talking about very significant numbers. I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Just because that was the method used in 33 doesn't imply that that's the method that would be used today. Here's the issue, though, when you're looking at relative strength or weakness of currencies. Let's say, for instance, that the argument is made, I like 
the Canadian dollar or I like the Swedish kroner or I like the Australian dollar better than the U.S. dollar because they are resource-based economies and therefore I'd rather have exposure to their currencies than the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. Here's the weakness in that argument. There's strength and weakness. Right. The strength of the argument is, yes, in fact, they have tangible assets. They have the underground substructure asset that does legitimize their currency and it means that they may be the better currency to own when all the dust settles. Mm -hmm. But the problem is this, you're really talking about having a relative winner. In absolute terms, you can still lose money. The dollar takes a hit by 30% and they take a hit by either more or less, mainly because in the environment where you assume the dollar is cratering, it's also an environment where you can assume that global GDP is contracting. Now, what is the cash flow into those countries? It is on the basis of those natural resources which they're selling in the open market. So you see, if you view the currency as something of the stock of that country, yeah. and they're losing cash flow significantly because global growth is contracting and, and international trade is in decline, then guess what? the shares of that company are going to decline too. Now, all we're saying is that on a balance sheet basis, you do have greater strength in those countries, and they're likely to survive. But that doesn't mean that in absolute terms, you're not going to lose money. You're only a winner on a relative basis. So again, you may lose 10, 15% in the Canadian dollar and 25 or 30%, or if we actually end up in an extinction event for the US dollar, then yes, you did much better being in those foreign currencies. But that doesn't mean when you look at your statement that you're not going to be seeing red. Well, and David, you know, one of the things that we've seen through the decades of watching people try to get into various currencies for protection is that more often than not, the politics of the country itself actually has more effect than the resources. It has more effect than the markets or inflation, deflation. It's almost always some political change that causes people to go, oh, my gosh, I had the safest bet out there, and now it's a horrible loss. Well, and I mean, for simplicity's sake, if I was looking for a foreign currency... I wouldn't look at the Swiss franc because it has gold backing. If the only reason you're buying the Swiss franc is because of its gold backing, then just buy gold and forget the Swiss franc because then you don't have to worry about the Swiss National Bank. You don't have to worry about the fiscal and monetary authorities who can change the direction of the currency in the short term while you thought you had a good bet going. Eliminate the people risk. Eliminate the PhD risk. Eliminate the management risk of a currency and own the currency which is not subject to those variables. Again, for simplicity, if you're looking for a foreign currency, I'd probably choose gold bullion over something even like the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar. We have allocations to those currencies at times. Don't today. We might tomorrow. Right. But again, we take a mature perspective that we are comfortable being relative winners, even if in absolute terms we do see a loss. Well, and David, you have a staff of people who do this all day long and have done it for decades. And so this is not something that for the person who just comes in and checks their portfolio every couple of weeks, you don't want to be playing in other currencies, do you? Well, and we mentioned the Brazilian real a few weeks ago. You know, they've moved interest rates up to, to astronomical heights for the fixed income investor and perhaps the neophyte coming into the fixed income space, you look at U.S. yields and you say, that's not a very attractive yield. I'd rather buy Brazilian real yielding 10, 12 percent. Sure. Well, guess what? As they've lowered rates 50 basis points and again recently 50 basis points, what happens to the currency? You know, you see a 20, 25 percent decline in the value of that currency in less than two months. Kevin, that's very interesting. When you begin to chase yield, yes, you can find that there is, in fact, greater risk attached to it. That's one lesson to learn. But the other thing is you cannot think as an investor in generalities. Brazil, the breadbasket of Latin America, surely on the basis of natural resources and trade with China, it is a sure bet. I'd rather own that currency than some bankrupt old maid like the U.S. dollar. Well, guess what? The U.S. dollar has actually fared better in this short period of time than the Brazilian real. So, again, back to that question of time frame. If the investor is willing to say, I can make a bet for the long run, and I don't care about the short-term volatility, you may be comfortable in taking foreign currencies into the fold, into your portfolio, and you may be proven right in the long run. My view is that foreign currencies are to be traded, not to be invested in. Right. There are short-term opportunities that make sense and can boost yield within a portfolio, particularly in the liquid part of, a, of an account. But playing currencies on a long-term basis, you are at the end of the whip, and that whip is controlled by the fiscal and monetary authorities, just the same as the U.S. dollar is by the Fed. So it reminds me of the commercial that says, trained professionals 
professional, do not try this at home. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, David, we got a question. Yeah, of course, the, a lot of these questions right now are factored on the triangle. And uh, I'm so happy that the, our listeners are getting this triangle because as they ask the questions, they're asking them in relation to rebalancing the triangle, what percentage, why we would have different mandates. I'll go to Hugo's question right now, and he says, what triggers a rebalance of the triangle? Well, and he goes on to say, is it a certain percentage over under 33% from one side of the triangle? If you're an advocate of the inflation or hyperinflation scenario, wouldn't you want to leave your precious metal side alone to keep growing? keep something in the stock and bond side and minimize cash. If you believe in a deflationary future, wouldn't you want a bigger cash side, some precious metals, and fewer stocks? Right. So deflation versus inflation. He, he goes on to say, while I've been in the inflation, hyperinflation camp, the deflation argument seems to have some merit. Yes, there are a lot of Federal Reserve notes, paper and electronic, out there. But if debt was required for their creation, then wouldn't the destruction of debt, deleveraging, result in fewer Federal Reserve notes, making them more valuable and in demand? Now, I know Mr. Bernanke is trying to thwart the deleveraging process, but it must ultimately happen or will be mired in an economic malaise for a long time. Enjoy your weekly commentary immensely, even when your guests and I are not in sync, as the discussion makes me reevaluate my ideas. Right. Hey, Kevin, I, I think just on that last point, that is why we have divergent opinions on the program. Not because we're trying to sort of sample and be fair and, and sort of in an open fashion say, you know, anything's possible sure. and we just must keep an open mind. You know, very much like G.K. Chesterton, who said an open mind is like an open mouth intended to be closed on something solid. Our explorations with different guests are towards a direct end. But we want to make sure that we're not mistaken. And so we continue to reassess and reanalyze with each step along the way. And that does include taking people with very divergent opinions. Sure. Sometimes it'll be a Keynesian when we don't necessarily like Keynesian. But that's Sorry. okay. I mean, yeah, right. That's okay. The question is how refined is our thinking in the process? Right. And I think Hugo's right. Ultimately, those discussions make you reevaluate your ideas and check your assumptions, make sure that they are, in fact, valid. Okay, but to the answer of his question. Well, let's look at the triangle again, and I, I know we've, we've talked about it many times, but the idea of the triangle includes we don't know everything. Right. We cannot know the future, and I'm not taking a position one way or the other whether or not an outcome is inflationary or hyperinflationary or deflationary. We're in a position to weather the storm. And if your first priority as an investor is to keep what you have, then the perspective triangle does a very adequate job of positioning you to survive and to thrive on the other side, whether the outcome is inflationary or deflationary. Having a balance between cash, having a balance between equities, having a balance between precious metals puts you in a position to be right even if you're only partially wrong, or to be wrong only partially and still remain right. It allows that healthy schizophrenia that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Dave. I would suggest that where someone begins to place a bet is where they diverge from the triangle. And, and where you see an overemphasis is, in fact, where someone is saying, I'm comfortable playing the odds, quote-unquote, increasing my risk, and not just playing for survival, so to say, not just trying to preserve assets but grow them. I mean, that's where a client would say, well, I would want a little bit more of an allocation here, or I'm willing to increase my risk there. Why? Because just getting through is not in their minds sufficient. Right. But I think the perspective triangle is in fact sufficient to cover all the bases, whether it is inflationary or deflationary. It's the deflationists who have a deep faith that it can only go their way with their 100% cash and have nothing in gold. And that's been a very painful process over the last decade. It is the inflationists who neglect just how severe the deleveraging is, which does in fact need to occur. And Hugo's point is well made. Sure, and they may have 100% in gold or close to it. And may at some point have to face the music. You may have a year, two years, three years where you are so wrong and so upside down and forced to play that game of patience, waiting, waiting, waiting until you are vindicated. And that's not a position that I think most investors can handle from an emotional and from a stress perspective. So I think the balance perspective is very helpful. Now, back to the first part of his question, what triggers a rebalance of the triangle? Is it a certain percentage over under the third for one side of the triangle? Kevin, I think this is a tricky point because the classic Wall Street rebalancing is, is essentially when you move out of target, 
on a 1%, 2% basis, you immediately reallocate and reshuffle. Right. I guess what we're looking at is for the wise investor to look at the perspective triangle and up front say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think balance to me looks like this. A balanced perspective includes the potential downside in a lot of different areas, and so I have this particular balance. What you're going to see is one of those particular themes develop and be proven right. Whether it is the inflation, hyperinflation scenario or the deflation scenario, you will see it in the values of the perspective triangle in one side or the other of your, of your portfolio. Sure. And as you have supporting evidence for a theme that is now gaining traction as opposed to just theoretically possible, you'll know that, yes, you were right. And the question is, do you change the theme and rebalance at that point? And I would suggest no. I would not suggest that you compound your risk accordingly. You know, if the deflation theme begins to materialize, I wouldn't sell gold to move to cash in support of you know, being able to buy more ounces at a cheaper price. Right. Allow your cash to multiply its, its purchasing power and just let it go. There's going to be a trigger event in the future, and it has more to do with macroeconomics. It has more to do with the structure of debt and that unwind which you had anticipated. And it needs to run its course. It needs to run its course to allow something to run its course, it's one of the reasons why we look at something like the Dow Gold Ratio and say, now that you're at inflection points, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, 1 to 1, even a negative ratio, that's not theoretically impossible, then you begin the process of reallocation. But you're getting to places where historically you have evidence for there being a turn of the tide. And that particular thematic, having been worked out to its ultimate and final conclusion, the humility that comes with the Dow Gold ratio of 3, 2, and 1 is that you don't know when it's going to turn. You don't know if the rules will change on you in the middle of the game. And so you prudently and in advance begin to allocate towards other assets before you actually need to. Well, and this brings me to a conversation you've had with several clients of ours just over the last week or so, where they're coming to you and they're saying, all right, Dave, I started with a third in my triangle in gold and silver. Now it's it's two-thirds of my triangle. And they're coming to you and they're saying, when do I reallocate? And these specifically, we're looking at reallocating into MWM, the managed side over on the left side of the triangle. You're very good about telling them, yes, I understand you're heavy on the base, but how do you feel about the insurance right now? And they're like, I really want it. And you're like, well, let's just watch. Okay, let's watch these ratios. You know, when we get to 5 to 1, maybe you're going to start easing into that, or 4 to 1, or 3 to 1 on the Dow. Well, it's going to be specific to the client. And we discussed that last week, Kevin, in saying that this really has to do with the degree of commitment made, or the degree, the percentage now that it represents of your total portfolio. Right. If someone's at 90% metals, out of their liquid assets because of the growth in those assets, then they need to be very diligent about being not only early, but very early. Right. You know, instead of a three to one ratio, maybe a five to one ratio is adequate to begin that bit. process, yeah. to begin that process of reallocation. If on the other hand, it's a five or 10% allocation, and that's what it's grown to from a 2% allocation, I think you have the ability to wait and allow that to play out a little bit more to your favor. Three to one, two to one, one to one being, again, at least according to that metric, something of a guideline for a reallocation. But the point that's being made here is that you allow the theme as it's evidenced in the perspective triangle, whether it's cash taking on a greater and greater import or metals taking on a greater and greater import, allow that thematic to play out. And what you're really looking for is not a number, but you're looking for an environment. You're looking for things that will change that particular thematic radically. The classic case in point would have been 79, Volcker being elected, and there being the real come to Jesus that you needed to have in relation to your portfolio. Does this change everything? And yes, so what's our effort every week, Kevin, to look at things from... Various perspective, not just ones that support our perspective, but to see, okay, what is changing? Is there something that radically alters our perspective and thus would force or trigger an event? It's not a number, unfortunately. Yeah. And as much as we like the three to one, two to one, there's a certain elegance and simplicity to that, but it actually is not a number. You have to be appraised of geopolitical issues. You have to be appraised of political issues. You have to be appraised of the changes in rules that relate specifically to the financial sector even. So I, I think when you continue to look at the world broadly and continue to analyze those issues and the ways they interrelate, 
you will know. I mean, I know this is vague, but you will know. What is the significance of an individual event? We have to weigh every event every day and see if that is, in fact, the event that changes the game. So for now, if we looked at Bernanke and said, I knew Paul Volcker, and you're no Paul Volcker. <laughs> Bernanke is not a game changer. He does nothing but perpetuate the game as it's being played today. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.